Welcome to the Bits of Gold podcast, episode 110. Today's episode is all about pulling each other forward in life and the lasting impact you can have by simply lifting those around you. Grip the rope and climb to the ceiling. Oh, you know, I doubted myself. I knew there was no way I could get up there. So my turn came and I had to try it because Mr. Snetchler, the new teacher, said I had to try everything. And every kid before me had not gotten to the top and uh, very few of them even got halfway. So no pressure on me because everybody else had failed. And so I started putting my hand over hand despite the 10 pounds of leg braces. I had unknown to me at that point in time, built up a lot of upper body strength from using the crutches. And I just kept going and I was elevating. And I got about three quarters of the way up and I said, oh, I'm gassed. I've been, I was farther than any other kid got. I said, I'm gassed. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And then I kicked in that strong mind kicked in and said, uh, 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 buddy, you're going to finish this. Welcome back to another episode of the bits of gold podcast. First off, I am so appreciative that you are here. Second, please don't forget to subscribe. More subscribers helps me attract more amazing guests, which in turn helps you continue to learn how to live a life of greater purpose. Words matter. Actions matter. I truly believe that your words and your actions have the ability to change the world. They have the ability to create a lasting impact in a person's life. So being intentional and thoughtful with your words and your actions is just so important. To take it one step further, the words and the stories we tell ourselves are equally just as important. There's that old quote from Henry Ford that goes, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. The words and the stories we tell ourselves really do determine the life that we ultimately live. On today's episode, that is exactly what we will be discussing. Today, my guest is Dave Clark and Doug Cornfield. And while in the third grade, Dave Clark's gym teacher's actions and words would forever positively impact and shape Dave's life. As an infant, Dave contracted polio that stunted his growth and left him without the full use of his legs. But despite that, and perhaps because of it, he was driven to excel in physical competition against so-called able-bodied people. He pursued his dreams and became a professional baseball player, playing in the minors. He went on to become the only professional baseball player to pitch from crutches. He is also coached in the majors, was a scout for the Baltimore Orioles, and a radio analyst for the Florida Everblades. Doug Cornfield connected with Dave Clark after his son was born with neither arm developed and one leg shorter than the other. Doug convinced Dave to partner and promote his amazing life story. They've since launched the Dave Clark Foundation, which hosts the D3 event. The D3 event happens throughout the year and is a pro-style practice with professional players at stadiums across the country where participants have the opportunity to hit, throw, catch, and run the bases with instruction from the best, regardless of anyone's limitations. In addition, they are the author of A Pound of Kindness, a children's book that captures the childhood of Dave Clark, the only professional baseball player to play and pitch with crutches. One of my biggest bits of gold from this episode is that you have the power to change someone's life with your words and your actions. Your own words and your own beliefs have the power to change your own life, regardless of your circumstance. And now let's welcome Dave Clark and Doug Cornfield. Dave Clark, Doug Cornfield, thank you so much for coming on the Bits of Gold podcast today. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks Thanks for having having us. us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I am excited to have you on to share your story. The more I read and started digging while I was researching your story, the more I became inspired and just the more excited I became to have you on today. Well, it's, it's always fun to do these things, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe just um, to kick this one off, you can both share a little bit about yourself. Just give a quick introduction, and then we'll we'll jump in from there. I had polio at 10 months of age back in 1953 and was taken from my parents' home, put in a reconstruction home, they called it at the time, in Ithaca, New York. Was there for a year. Came out wearing crutches and leg braces. Uh, due to the uh, after effects of polio, and grew up that way. That's a quick synopsis of the beginning of my life story. You got polio at 10 months of age, is that right? 10 months old. So young then. What was it like? Were you aware of what's going on, or how could you have been? It's, you're so young. What, what was that like at that age? No, I, I, had, I, 
have no recollection of the uh, the reconstruction hall. All I all I know is what my mom and dad related to me later in my life. I mean, I was far too young to remember any of that. I know mom related that she really got feeling down. They were allowed to visit two times a week. And uh, it was about a 40 minute drive from my hometown of Corning, New York. And mom related to me that when she would come over to visit, I would run to the nurse because the nurse was taking care of me and more in my eyes at 10 months old, uh, that, that was my mother. And so my real mom would come over and I would run away from her. And she said that tore her heart out. Uh, the fact that I didn't recognize my own real biological mother. I think the first recollection I really have is I grew up in a neighborhood, a working class neighborhood. My dad worked three jobs. And I think the first recollection I have was all the kids in the neighborhood really not treating me any differently than anybody else in that neighborhood. And my brothers and my parents were right in there with that. They didn't you know when I needed to get the hell kicked out of me, I got the hell kicked out of me. You know, when discipline was applied, and there was discipline in those days, by the way. I mean, we kind of lack that today sometimes. But when that was applied, I didn't get spared any special consequences. And that really forged my mental thinking to allow me to do what I did eventually in life. Mm. Just going backwards, how long were you in the facility when you had polio? I was there for a year. And I can relate a couple other stories that my mom told me and dad. One, on the first day over there, they convert, they, they had a conversation with the doctor on, on my admission. And the doctor told them there was a good chance I wasn't going to live. I can only imagine, uh, now that I'm a parent myself, I can only imagine how fearful that diagnosis was. Uh, and devastating to my parents. And a couple of weeks later, they had another conversation. And he said, looks like Dave's going to live, but he's going to be a vegetable. He'll never have any use of his muscles in his body. And then a year later, I came out walking with two full length metal leg braces and crutches. And if there was any, I don't know what word, if there's any advantage to having polio, at 10 months old, it was that I hadn't learned how to walk yet. So I didn't transition from learning how to walk to learning how to use braces and crutches, which really was an advantage to me because the braces and crutches were just normal. They were my normal and that's how I grew up. I didn't know any other way and I didn't have to transition. I think it's much harder for people who have physical limitations that have had to adjust to doing a new way of life. I didn't have to mm. do that. Got it. That makes sense. So when you were in grade school or growing up, you know, you shared a little bit about what it was like growing up in your neighborhood. How about school? What was your experience in school? Uh, not good at the beginning. You know, as I said, I was treated no different in the neighborhood and by my parents and brothers. I guess you can relate it to like racism. You don't know there's a racism until you get out of your element and you experience it the first time. And I didn't know it either until I went to grade school and I kind of got my first taste of bullying. Bullying existed. You know, it's not a new thing. It existed when I went to school and I got it firsthand. I was treated very differently by some students in the class because I looked different. I walked different. I did things in a non-normal way. And I was a little bit slower. You know, I could go up steps, I could walk, but I was slower. I heard that every day in school. I heard that from certain individuals every day in school. They kind of got a, a joy or whatever out of picking on Dave. So that opened my eyes up to a different world. And suddenly I realized, you know, that I, I was different. Mm -hmm. The thing that it didn't do was deter me. I think I was blessed with a very strong mind and it didn't deter me from doing whatever I wanted to do. Even though the kids might pick on me and they could tell me, I, you can't do this, you can't do it. It never stopped me. Uh, and there's some stories I could tell and I'm not sure they're appropriate here, how I handled those situations. If I told you a couple of those stories that today they would look down on the way I handled those situations. I did what I thought I had to do at the time. 
correct the situation. I do have to say it worked. <laughs> was there anyone, whether it be a friend, family, was there anyone who helped influence your, your mindset? You shared that you know you felt like you you were blessed with a strong mind, but was there anyone who influenced the way that you were able to move forward, just like carry yourself forward? Yeah, my parents, no question. You know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. My dad worked three jobs. Uh, I can remember him coming home. From, he worked in a factory, a local factory in uh, Painted Post, New York, called Ingersoll Rand. And he would work from 7 to 3 every day at the factory, come home, and always found time to play catch with me in the driveway. He would get dropped off by a co-worker two blocks from our house every day. I'd be waiting for him at that corner with two baseball gloves and a ball. And we'd walk two blocks home mm. and we'd get in the driveway and play catch for 30, 45 minutes every day. And then he would go in, shower, grab something quick to eat, and he'd go sell fuller brush. Uh, he was a fuller brush salesman. And then he worked selling magazines door to door. So I think my work ethic and Strong mind. And then my mom also, you know, she worked as a secretary at Corning Glassworks until I came down sick with polio when she had to step aside. But there were three boys in the family. So she was the old work-at-home mom at the time. So both my parents influenced me greatly in showing me how you work to get through life. You know, I hear that you were playing catch with your dad and that was something that you waited for him every day. But when did you first become or fall in love with baseball? Uh, I think probably after the story in grade school. In third grade, I had a new gym teacher. And because up through uh, kindergarten, first, second grade, there was always a chair on the sideline for me in PE class. Didn't allow me to participate. And I had to sit there and watch the kids do whatever the activity was that particular day. In third grade, we had a gym teacher. And the first day in his class, he told us what we were going to do. He clapped his hands. He said, let's go. And I automatically started to the sideline because I'd been conditioned to do so. But there was no chair. I kept going anyway until I heard this big booming voice go, where do you think you're going? And I turned around shaking and I said, I'm going over. And he told me then and there, he told me something I've never forgotten to this day. Called me back over and I went over shaking and he said, Dave, there may be things that you're not going to be able to do in this class this year, but you're never going to know what those things are until you give them a try and you're going to try everything we do this year. Boom. Hmm. Boom. That blew open my mind, <laughs> possibilities, potential. And first thing we did, that first activity that day was climbing the rope to the ceiling. I don't know if they even do that anymore, but you had to grip the rope and climb to the ceiling. Well, you know, I doubted myself. I knew there was no way I could get up there. So my turn came and I had to try it because Mr. Snetchler, the new teacher, said I had to try everything. And every kid before me had not gotten to the top. Very few of them even got halfway. So... No pressure on me because everybody else had failed. And so I started putting my hand over hand. Despite the 10 pounds of leg braces, I had, unknown to me at that point in time, built up a lot of upper body strength from using the crutches. And I just kept going. And I was elevating. And I got about three quarters of the way up and I said, oh, I'm gassed. I was farther than any other kid got. I said, I'm gassed, I'm, I'm done. And then I kicked in, that strong mind kicked in and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, buddy, you're going to finish this. And I started in again. Proved a couple things. One, there's always gas left in the tank. When you think you're done, there's always more gas in there. And that proved to me that there was, that you could get. I got to the top. I was the only kid in the class to get there. And now I had a big problem because I couldn't make that little S with your feet to slow your descent. So I came flying down the rope, yeah. hanging on it like this. <laughs> and I burned the hell out of my hands. <laughs> but 
but it was the best uh, burn, yeah, it was the best burn <laughs> feel when I got to the bottom because all the kids' jaws had dropped. Mr. Snetchler was applauding. And that, the next thing we did in his class was softball. And what it did to me mentally, I think, the ropes and so, and I and I found out that I had great hand-eye coordination in the softball, even though we had been playing at home. You know, now I was on the big stage in school, and I found that I could compete. And I think I equate that to the basketball player coming out of the ghetto, using basketball to get out of the ghetto, because it allowed me. What I did with climbing the rope being able to play softball and then in turn baseball allowed me to get out of that stereotype of disabled kid. And the kids mm-hmm. started looking at me differently. The bullying got less and less. And that's not correct. That's not right. But that's what happened. And then all of a sudden, got it. Uh, all of a sudden I developed a passion for baseball. I wanted to play little league like all the other kids. And Little League told me, nope, you can't. Williamsport said, no, you can't play. You're going to get injured. We're not going to allow you to play. Well, Corning, New York is about an hour from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And my parents literally drove to the Williamsport headquarters and figuratively went to bat for me. And they got them to change their mind. They got them to change their mind. I got into Little League, started playing, found I could compete against able-bodied kids and there was no challenger division of little league back then thank god i would have been channeled into challenger i'm pretty sure and i would not have been allowed to reach my potential i say that over and over today i said when you put a child into challenger little league make sure that's the level they belong at because there could be another dave clark out there that doesn't get pushed to reach his maximum potential by putting them in a challenger. But thank God there was no challenger then. I went and I played Little League, and that started my, like every other kid in that era, I dreamed of being a professional Major League Baseball player. Hmm. Looking back, so it sounds like, you know, you had so much support and love from, from your parents, which certainly helped in that story of them driving an hour away to, to go to bat for you. But how did they, that experience with your gym teacher affect the trajectory of of your life but also just the your mindset is would you say that that single moment had the greatest impact in terms of the way that you were able to carry yourself forward i'll put it this way to you i wouldn't be talking to you today i doubt very seriously without that without that uh you have the chance to go back and speak with uh, the gym teacher now funny you ask because uh doug and i reunited with mr snatchler in Washington, D.C., uh, how many years ago, Doug? I was like, it was pre-COVID, so it was like 2018, 2019, something like that. Anyway, Mr. Snatchler was a military man, and he was being honored at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., and we got invited to take part in that. And we have created an award of our own now called the Pulling Each Other Along Award, and it, Mr. Snetchler was 93 at the uh, memorial, and I got to sit next to him, present him that award, and then the two of us went and laid a wreath out at the memorial. Wow, that's amazing. Dave did it uh, with uh, many tears in his eyes. That has to be, obviously, both ways, just so such an incredible moment in both of your lives. I mean, you know, to think that this gym teacher took a – a very different approach than, you know, you share the story of sitting there on the, the sidelines, having the chair being being set aside for you in years prior. And then all of a sudden, this gym teacher comes along and says, that's that's not what we're going to do here today. It's so incredible. One of the things I remember from the D.C. Uh, experience with Mr. Stetchler was he was so proud to introduce me to his cohorts there. And he kept saying, it's a guy that changed, the guy that made it all the way up the ropes. <laughs> It was, it was, it was kind of, uh, it was touching. It was a proud moment, and he was very proud. And and then afterwards, we went. Doug and I were invited to his family home, uh, in uh, was it in Western Pennsylvania, I believe. 
and or I think it was Virginia, Maryland. but it was, uh, yeah, yeah, somewhere. I, I, we went yeah, out there and spent several hours with Mr. Snetchler, and it was uh, uh, it was really a, a great experience. That's amazing. Everyone needs someone like that in in their life, and I feel like, and we'll get to it. I feel like what you're doing in D three Day is very much you know paying it forward and doing what he did for you for so many people on on a massive scale. How do you end up starting to play in in the MLB in the minors? How does that all come about? At 16, I, I was holding my own against some of the better athletes in our little town, but I was kind of like the big fish in a little pond. But I started dr- dreaming that I, I, wanted, I wanted to at least explore whether or not I had the ability to go any further. And number one, I wasn't throwing that hard. So I was throwing 79 miles an hour, which you could catch with a Kleenex in the pros. So I figured I had to think outside the box on doing something that would allow me to at least pursue my dream. And that became the knuckleball. You know, I started throwing it with different grips, different arm angles, different release points. Probably took me a couple of years before I could say that this is how it works for me. This is the best way for this pitch to work for me. Um, Dave, when did you find out that pitch was working? (laughs) My dad was a pretty good athlete in his day. And so he would catch me during some of the sessions, and uh, he never had any problem catching me with my curveball or 79-mile-an-hour fastball or change-up. Uh, he didn't have any trouble catching me. But when I started working with a knuckleball, he didn't have any trouble with that either until one day uh, when I felt like it was all coming together, I threw a knuckleball, and he was catching me, and he, he never even got a piece of leather on it, and it hit him, and he started jumping around, and saying four letter words <laughs> and I got I run down and I'm you know I get, I get him calmed down and and uh, he gets ready to catch again <laughs> and I threw another knuckleball and he didn't get leather on it again this time and it it hit him right uh square in the uh, place you don't want to get hit <laughs> and uh, oh, oh he just he doubled over and his head went down to the ground and oh man, there were two parts to that final story because I knew I had a pitch that was really working now. So I got all excited. Here, Dad got hit, and he's doubled over in pain. And I run halfway to him, going, "Dad, I got it! I think we got it! I got it!" <laughs> and then all of a sudden, halfway there, I realized, "Oh, Dad's down. He's really hurt." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and if you've never been hit there, where I'm describing, you don't know that feeling. <laughs> It's not pleasant. And so dad finally got to the point where he could get up and breathe again. But that's when I knew that pitch was pretty effective. This one. And then dad also said, that's the last time I'm ever going to catch you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and at that point, you know, I'm, I'm about 16. I was afraid to tell anybody my plans, even my parents. And uh, I did tell my grandfather. He was the first one I told. And he told me, Dave, why don't you? go get a safe, secure job at the Corning Glassworks where everybody in Corning worked. And I didn't listen to my grandfather. I didn't listen to him. I, I went ahead and pursued my dream. And uh, What were you scared of in regards to telling your parents your, about your dreams? Uh, how absurd it sounded. You know, now that I'm where I'm at now in life, it's pretty absurd. You got a guy on two full-length leg braces and crutches telling you that, that you want to go play pro baseball. What are the chances? Yeah. What are the chances? My parents supported me my whole life. And my fear there was that they were finally going to, for the first time in my life, say, Dave, no, can't do that. Mm. So I didn't tell them. So how do you get net? And again, you know, my mind's always, the wheels are always spinning in my mind, which I think eventually allowed me to be a fairly effective coach. But I had to start thinking, how do I get somebody to look at me? I'm in a little town of 10,000 people. There's no internet. There's no computer at that time. How do you go about getting looked at? Nobody's going to come to this little blip on the map to look at me. So I hand wrote 24 letters to every major league organization, expressing my dreams and desires in those letters. And I got three replies out of 24. And I got one shot. And I think a message that I always try to get across to players today, players that I've coached in the past, 
and this goes for anything in life, not just baseball or sports, but if you want something bad enough, you have to be willing to work and put in the time without any certainty you're ever going to get a chance. You got to be willing to put in the work with no guarantees that somebody's going to give you a shot. And that's what I did. Again, how many people are going to give a guy with crutches and leg brace a chance? Chances are slim to none, but I still worked out four hours a day, six days a week, ran five miles a day on my crutches, lifted the weights, rode the stationary bike, all those things with no guarantee I was ever going to get looked at. But when you do that, if you get one chance, you're prepared. You're prepared. If it doesn't work out, you knew and you know you gave it your best shot. So that was my motto. Be prepared. Chances are you're never going to get a shot, but be prepared in case you do. And I got the one shot, and I was ready. And I gave it everything I had. And that one little shot led to a 40-some-year career in professional baseball. And I've never, I tell Doug, I, I really never worked a day in my life. I've been blessed. Looking back on those moments, you know, when there is that unknown, but you're in the pursuit of your dream, was there anything you did as it relates to trying to, like, manifest it? Were you writing it down? You know, I'm sure it was constantly on your head, but was there anything more internally or introspectively that you were doing? Were you writing down, I will play professional baseball? Or do you have any sort of practice? Or, you know, a lot of that has become like quite common or more popular today. A lot of people are looking for ways to manifest their dreams. I'm curious if there's anything that you did specifically then that just helped you from a from a mental standpoint, from a mentality standpoint, say, like, this is going to be my reality. I, uh, I journaled a lot back in the day. I, I, I journaled a lot hand wrote down all my workouts and mm. certainly I had a record of my workouts and I still have them somewhere. I don't know where they are now, but I still have them and I could increase, you know, I didn't just haphazardly work out. I mean, I, I did work out with a purpose and uh, that purpose was to reach my dream. And so I journaled everything down. I kept track of how much, uh, how many pounds I was lifting on a particular day. And I could increase those as it got along the way. Uh, I kept track of my times when I was running. I ran sprints. I was the slowest freaking guy going. But I kept, in, from my perspective, I could see where there was, you know, a faster time. I don't know if that answers your question. Let me add to this a little bit, Dave and, and Dan. Dave and I are working together with a guy that does neuro teachings. His name's Nathan. And and it's interesting because when I first met with Nathan and he wanted to work with us and, and we're, we're actually helping him to make even better connections. He works with major league baseball players, NHL hockey guys, and he's a neuro specialist. And when I met with him, I go, I bet you Dave did a lot of this stuff before you gave it a name. And as we've gone through his program and we can't, you know, we're actually under a non-disclosure, so we can't say the stuff that he's done, but it's amazing how much Dave did to connect his mind because what I'd always, what Dave has said is he, you know, the strongest muscle that you need is your brain and that's, what's going to help. And so Dave strengthened his brain and probably much the way that Tom Brady does now. And some of the other greats, they're doing stuff naturally because they've already thought it through and their, their connectivities of their mind actually um, are already triggering. We found out that Dave was already doing many of the exercises that were being taught that he's teaching these MLB and these NHL hockey players today. So Dave's mind is a big part of this. When he didn't have all the physical skills, he had to use his mind. He had to think outside the box and, and he had to dream about it. He had, to, he had to see himself on the mound pitching against these professional players. And I know he did that because one of his main quotes is there's two types of dreamers. There's dreamers that just dream and then there's dreamers that dream and do. So you got to combine those two where you don't just dream about it. You go out and you go after it and you go do it. It makes sense. When you have such such a big dream of making it to play professional baseball, something to that scale, you know, you can't just say it. You know, you need to you need to really believe it. It needs to come from a place with, you know, great, great intention behind those words. It can't just be, oh, yeah, I'm going to play in them. You know, that if you're if you're making a claim like that, there needs to be work that's going on in the background that maybe you're not seeing that people aren't seeing. 
to enable you to, to actually get on that path. To be able to connect his mind where he knew he wasn't going to be able to throw 95 miles an hour from crutches and legs that virtually, you know, or don't don't function uh, in the same way that, you know, other legs function. And so he wasn't going to be able to get the power that you would need to throw. So he had to do something differently. And that's where he developed the knuckleball. And, you know, if you're not a baseball person, it's a it's a ball that doesn't spin and it floats. And there's nothing harder to hit something that's floating at you. And that's basically the ball that he developed. And. And it almost got him a shot at the bigs. You know, he had the Chicago White Sox calling him and tracking him back in the mid '70s. Um, so it wasn't just a, he wasn't out there just as a player, um, as a sideshow. Uh, Dave actually had some seasons where he got a lot of people out and even was considered the fireman of the year or the relief pitcher of the year uh, in the mid '70s. Dave, so you know, I I just want to highlight one other thing. You mentioned it before. You said I I'm blessed. I live the life, and I'm I'm blessed. You know, someone might hear that and say, you know, you you contracted polio, you know, at ten months of age, forever changed your life. But you know, it's it's powerful hearing you say, "I'm blessed." I'm curious if you could share a little bit more about that and just dig in, dig into that a little bit. Well, not only did I have polio, but in 2016 I had cancer. So I'm also a cancer survivor, but I've always been a battler. The human mind is so strong. It, and you can make it strong through the program Doug is is talking about. But being a uh, blessed, I got to do something that I loved to do all through my life and get paid for it. Now, I can't say that I never, I did say that I never worked a day in my life. Well, when I was back in high school, my dad ran, a, by, by this time, he, had, he and my mom had uh, become owners of a garbage company, a small garbage company in Corning, New York. So I did work on the back of a garbage truck for one summer. I found out that being a professional baseball player is a hell of a lot better than working on the back of a garbage truck for a summer, uh, at least in my eyes. Uh, I also did some pumping of gas, door-to-door -door surveys in between seasons, because believe it or not, I know this is, this is absurd too, but my first contract in pro baseball played me 40 bucks a week and five dollars a day meal money so it didn't make the big money back then that and granted the dollar was worth more then but uh we didn't make the huge bucks that they're making today and so you had to work in the off season and i and i would do that but for the most part as my career progressed i was able to make enough money to survive on my on just from playing coaching whatever and there's not many people that can say they've done something they love to do their whole life and gotten paid for it and the people yes. that i've gotten to meet the people that i've gotten to do things with and for you know it's hard i have post polio now which is something that wasn't even heard about or, or even known about until the late 80s but even though I have that, and now I can't use the crutches as often. I've got to use a three-wheeled motorized scooter. When I do these camps on the baseball field, I use the scooter because I'm not able to use the crutches as I used to. I wouldn't change a thing. I just wouldn't change a thing. Uh, to have gone through life and had the experiences I've had, the joys, the downs, man, if I could do it all over again, do it in a heartbeat. Uh, it's beautiful. Doug, how do you end up coming into Dave's life? How, what's the what's the connection here? Well, that's a whole nother podcast, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the real quick skinny is um, I was l moving my family from Atlanta. I had five kids at the time. And I read an article about Dave. And my youngest son was, um, I don't even know if he was one year old yet. But he was born with neither arm fully developed. Um, actually, mostly not developed. And I was reading this article about Dave. He had won the Heroes of Sports Award. It was a big award given to him, a national award. ESPN guys were there, you know, the whole bit. Big $17,000 check presented to him for him doing sports camps for children with uh, differing disabilities. And the weird thing for me is I'm in Atlanta. I'm transitioning my family to Corning, where my wife grew up. And Dave's from Corning. Uh, Corning's not a very big town. It's like 10,000 people. Uh, most of the people in the world only know Corning through its large company that's here in the town, Corning and Corporate. So 
it was just one of those weird things. Uh, you can say the winds blew us together. I don't know. But uh, David just finished up a career of coaching in the Swedish major leagues. He didn't really cover this, but he went into coaching at every level, Olympic coach, um, Atlanta Braves coach, coached in the Swedish major leagues, three-time championship coach. Uh, but he just mentioned post-polio. It started getting the best of him, and he retired from that. And he was a full-time scout, but he had moved back to Corning. And uh, we were able to meet. He was uh, doing a part-time coaching, um, pitching coaching at a local professional team. And with uh, my son Gideon in my arms, uh, I was able to meet Dave. And he might regret that. But uh, about 10 years later, we had become friends. And I said, you know what? I'm leaving Merrill Lynch. I want to do something with your story. Um, and we wound up uh, starting to get some speaking events and really Dave's heart as we business as we became business partners in, in pursuit of a movie deal and things like that. Um, Dave uh, basically wanted to do more sports camps for kids with limitations and disabilities, and he'd been doing that his whole career since the 70s. And so we made that our life's objective of, of creating camps and opportunities for families and children and young adults with all different limitations to have a day on the field with primarily professional baseball and hockey teams. Uh, Dave's two sports is uh, baseball and hockey. He didn't get into the hockey story, but he played for, he played uh, ice hockey goalie in, in college, even though he couldn't skate Daniel. So that's probably a whole nother podcast, but. <laughs> and the organization today, it's called D D three day. Yeah. We call the, we call the events disability dream and do. We have a fund down in Florida. That's the disability dream and do fund. And then Dave and I have a couple of business entities uh, one for the movie and one for products that we sell. And uh, that's been our primary avenue to raise money for the sports camps uh, is through speaking events, through book sales. I have two books that I've written. One is a children's book. We didn't even talk about that story, but it's a very powerful story uh, of Dave in, in elementary school. Uh, where a first grade classmate of his um, was so helpful. Dave thanked him in a book. And I brought these two men together in a surprise reunion and to say it got emotional would be an understatement. So uh, we've, we've got all these great stories of Dave. We've collected those. He's got a book out called uh, Diamond in the Rough, the Dave Clark story, which is still available on Amazon. And then we have a brand new book called Pulling Each Other Along. David mentioned that earlier. We have an award called the Pulling Each Other Along Award. Now we have a book called Pulling Each Other Along Award. And a free download can actually be the, of the foreword written by Terry Bradshaw is available on the PullingEachOtherAlong.com website. And, and that's 30 more stories like Dave's of sharing what pulled and helped them along in their lives. And so we've got, we've got some incredible stories. I'm a little biased since I'm one of the co-authors, but uh, let's just say it's really great. Is the D3 day, of, is it a one-day event each year, or is, do they happen more frequently than that? Yeah, we, we were up to about 10 events that we were involved in, and then COVID kind of knocked us off our tracks a little bit. And so I think we'll probably have six or seven we're up to again this year. Uh, primarily, we're, we were lacking in funding to do other camps to spread ourselves out. You know, the COVID hit, hurt our funding as well. And so we're getting the funding back and rolling. And uh, once we get the funding, the goal is really to do upwards of 20, 25 events a year. Um, they're all free to the families. We don't charge. Uh, we have upwards of two, 300 people at our events, about 80 to 120 children and young adults with different disabilities on a pro field or a college field, different things that we do, um, doing the activities with the pro players or the college players that we have involved. Wow, that's that's absolutely incredible. What would what would you say is the highlight of, of those events? Oh my gosh. There's so there's so many. We talk about, you know, the kids on the field. I'll just give you one instance. Uh, about a month ago we did a camp in Rochester, New York. And we have another Dave, Dave Stevens, uh, who works with us. Dave was born with no legs seven-time Emmy Award winner with ESPN, and he played baseball, football, and wrestled in high school and college. So that's the quick summary of our Dave Stevens. So I got these two incredible Daves. They come to our event. Dave Stevens is a bit of a ham. He's uh, been in media his whole life. And he found this little boy in a walker um, that was at our camp. And we do stations, so there's a lot of activity. And the little boy had never caught a ball before, I don't think. He's, um, you know, he's sitting in his walker, as cute as can be. His mom's there. And Dave positions his hands so that he can catch a ball. And Dave, like three feet away from him, throws a ball to him. The boy catches it. And if you want to see absolute exuberance come out of a little boy, he's, his hands are flying up in the air. He's going nuts. He's, he, he, and then he catches a second ball. And same thing. He's going crazy. He's like so happy. And he goes, I can catch. You know, and it's like it's just those are the kind of moments that get created. 
at, at Disability Dream and Do D3 Day Camps. And um, I could literally do a whole podcast of sharing these types of stories. So that's the highlight. Yeah, it sounds absolutely incredible. You share quite a bit, obviously, in this in this episode in regards to mentality and nothing really holding holding you back from telling yourself that it's not possible. I'm curious, is there anything that from a mentality standpoint, like what would be the the advice or the wisdom that you would share with someone to to embrace, you know, sort of this why not me mentality and that it is that it is possible. And it sounds like, you know, there's a lot Dave, in, in your own story, just that nothing, nothing really held you back. You know, you, you went for what you believed and you went for it full, full throttle. I think that you have to be real with yourself. You have to know, you just have to have common sense and be realistic with what you have. And by that, I mean, I've said this many times before, if I'd have had a choice, I would have played pro hockey over pro baseball. At the college level, I quickly realized this is about as high as you're going to go, buddy, in, in hockey. Your abilities are just about capped at this level in hockey. So you have to be realistic in pursuit of what you're doing. However, let me say this. I love hockey. Wish I could have played professionally. Realized I couldn't, but I didn't give up my hockey dream. And by that, I mean... When I would come home from the baseball season, there was a college in our area called Elmira College that had a hockey team. So I walked in one day and to the, uh, just off the street, cold call, walked into the uh, station that broadcasts their games on the radio. And I said, uh, are you looking for a color commentator? Yep, they were. And they asked me if I had any experience. I didn't have any experience. I said, yeah, I did. Well, I figured I wasn't really lying because my brother and I used to play those board, the board hockey games. And I would be broadcasting them while we were playing. I'd be going, and down the right wing side, the shot score! And so I figured I wasn't really lying. I did have some kind of experience. And the guy told me, he says, uh, he says, all right, we're doing an exhibition game on Friday night at the arena. There's three of you that are going to compete for the color commentator job. You're each going to do one period. So I did my period that night. I make a long story short, I got the job. Three games into my career as a color commentator, the play-by-play man quits. And we're going on the road to Rochester, New York, New York, to play the Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT. And I get a call that morning, and I go, you ever done play-by-play play before? I go, yeah, oh, yeah. And I, again, a little white lie, but not a complete lie. <laughs> so I uh, uh, I go to Rochester, New York, and I become the play-by-play play guy. I did that for 10 years. And then Elmira got a pro team. And I slid over into the pro team and moved to Florida. And there's a team in this where I'm living in Florida right now that was in the same league as the team in Elmira, New York. Did four more years with the team here in Florida. During that period of time, one of my broadcast partners had graduated to being the play-by-play guy for the Nashville Predators in the NHL. And I get a call from him one day and he goes, hey, you wanna join me in Tampa and and, uh, be my color commentator? And I, and I said, nah. I, he goes, what? I go, yeah, look, hell yeah, tell me when and where. And uh, so then the end result of that story is I couldn't play professional hockey. If you're pursuing a dream and you don't get to where you want to go, you can still do other things in that area that you started out dreaming about. I took an offshoot. I took an exit ramp on my dream to be a pro hockey player. But I ended up doing NHL games as a broadcaster. And how many times how many oh, guys can say that? So, you know, your dream, 100%. you may not get to where you thought you were going to be, but you can still dream and reach something in that area. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's amazing. Well, Dave and Doug, truly incredible. Your story, 
what you're doing today, how you're helping people on a massive scale today. Where can people connect with you or what's the best website for them to go to if they want to learn more, donate, get involved? So there's two. There's uh, d3day.com, and that talks about our sports camps that we do for kids with limitations. And then where, the, where people can help more financially with just buying books and uh, my children's book, A Pound of Kindness, and the Pulling Each Other Along a book, uh, go to pullingeachotheralong.com, pullingeachotheralong.com, download a free forward by Terry Bradshaw, check out the book, get it. Um, amazing stories that are going to inspire. It's a great book to give away. If you know people that are um, dealing with uh, certain issues, they need some, some inspiration in their life. But it's also a way, a part of that mission of pulling each other along is we want people to share what, share to the people that's helped pull them along in their life. And we even have a greeting card that people can buy to give to the people that have helped them in their life. So uh, uh, do that, inspire that. Know that the you know by helping Dave and I in our businesses also helps us do these sports camps for kids with limitations. Amazing! Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having us, Daniel. Thank you, Dan, for having us. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Bits of Gold podcast. There were so many bits of gold in this episode. But one of the things that really stood out to me is the power that we have in our words and our actions, the stories we tell ourselves, but equally the ability we have to really lift someone up. So this week, I want to challenge you, whether it be a friend, a family member, or a complete stranger, I want to challenge you to lift them. It can be as simple as telling someone, you know, they are enough, that they are good enough, that they are on track, that they are on their way to achieving their dreams. But I want you to go out there and give someone words of encouragement. Dave's story is a shining example of what our words can do to help others. Those words of kindness can really go a long way. So get out there this week. Contact one friend, one family member, or even a complete stranger and lift them with words of encouragement. If you like this episode, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you do, I'll probably read it on an upcoming episode. That's all for today. Thank you for living with purpose today and every day, and see you next time. I love your podcast. This is gold. This is where it's at.